Welcome everybody to our Wednesday afternoon webinar. Um, today's, this afternoon's topic is on supporting receptive language skills in infants and toddlers. Our presenter today, um, who we're thrilled to have back with us again, is Shauna Ruzich, who is a speech language pathologist and founder of Speech Tree, as well as actively involved in ISHA and um, an early intervention committee co-chair. And she also happens to be a consultant with the early intervention training program. So for those of you who were able to participate on the last webinar that Shauna facilitated, we get to uh, spend a little bit of time this afternoon with her again. Hello, everyone. After hearing today's presentation, I hope that you'll um, learn a lot as we go along. And we have some learning objectives. And the first one is that I hope that you'll understand why receptive language skills need to happen first. I hope that you'll understand the connection between receptive and expressive communication and that you'll gain strategies to build upon a child's receptive language in everyday context. So where the speech language pathologist is often the key person targeted for having the most knowledge and for understanding the most about receptive language, its acquisition and incorporation of strategies with the child and the family. As an early interventionist, and certainly as a parent, this information pertains to all of us in some way. The hope is that as a parent, as an EI provider, you'll gain information that you can use within your intervention and at home that is friendly and functional and can be facilitated by anyone. So the question is, what is receptive language? If you can back up a slide here. <laughs> it's in general or in broad terms, it's the ability to understand spoken language. But it's definitely much more than understanding what is said. Context you can, is the situation. And it's what's happening in the moment. So context is critical to a child's understanding of spoken language. It involves gaining information and meaning from the routine, such as we finished our breakfast, so it's time to get dressed. Or first we must brush our teeth and then go to bed. But some children who have difficulty understanding spoken language may appear to be understanding because they may be able to pick up on key words or, this, or really like, like we're displaying here, um, you know, where the children are relying on visual information. Language is, is very complex and the varying vocabulary we use within context requires understanding. So that visual information, you know, may uh, give the child a clue. So if mom holds up her keys and says, we're going to the car, then the child sees the keys and can associate that. Or a green light means go. And, and there's many other examples, obviously. But other things, um, you know, that a child begins to associate are the sounds, and the sounds with words. We often ask, does your child, you know, recognize environmental sounds? So a siren, you know, meaning that a fire engine or a fire truck or an ambulance is coming down the street or seeing and hearing the word ball associating that it's a round, bouncy thing that we play with. So as um, children, you know, begin to make the connection, there's other um, concepts such as size and shape and color and time. They're hearing, you're such a big girl, and then using big in other contexts, like give me the big one or the little one and so forth. So there's so much more to language. Again, it's complex, and visuals help us with the understanding. Additionally, grammar, you know, two cookies or, or one ball, things like that, um, regular past tense, all of the things that develop in time and they are required to understand. 
action words. No climbing. You know, what does that mean to them? So as you can see, receptive language encompasses specific information that often has to be broken down for children to fully understand spoken language, especially when the child is having difficulty. So receptive language is important in order to communicate successfully. It is enhanced by communication partners, and it develops before expressive language. To be an effective communicator, a child really needs to understand what is being said. The stages of language development are universal among human beings. However, the age and the pace at, at which each child reaches each milestone of language development vary greatly among children. Language development in an individual child must be compared with norms rather than with other individual children. You know, how often do we hear, you know, um, Johnny, I know he's, you know, he's talking a lot more and he, you know, he seems to really understand, but we really have to look at our norms as interventionist. In general, girls develop language at a faster rate than boys, More than, but it is individualized. More than any other aspect of development, language development reflects the growth and the maturation of the brain. So language, go back up a slide, language development begins before birth. Towards the end of pregnancy, a fetus begins to hear sounds and speech coming from outside the mother's body. And then language learning begins at birth. Infants are attuned to the human voice, and they prefer it over other sounds. In particular, they prefer the higher pitch characteristics of female voices. They are very attentive to the human face, especially when the face is talking. Look at that picture, how that baby is really looking at her, you know, his or her mom's eyes. So they're attentive to the human face. Although crying is a child's primary means of communication at birth, language immediately begins to develop via repetition and imitation. So we must Note, as interventionist, if a child is paying attention to the speaker's face, but specifically the speaker's mouth. So language learning starts at birth, and, and babies are aware of sounds in the environment, and they listen to the speech of those close to them. They cry if there's an unexpected noise. Loud noises wake them, and they quiet and become still in responses to new sounds. And we often obtain various references, you know, different sources to refer to the norm. So I've gathered some different um, resources to look at some of the milestones. So we're utilizing not only our testing tools, but we should be, you know, having knowledge of, of various um, language development charts and and, you know, as interventionists, studying those to, you know, get a comparison. So this particular one comes from the um, healthofchildren.com. And so you can see, you know, like I highlighted, between zero to three months, even though we often think, you know, wow, there shouldn't really be a whole lot going on at that age, there, there really is. I mean, children are... Our babies are learning to turn to you when you speak and smile when they hear your voice, and they seem to recognize familiar voices and will quiet at the sound of it when they're crying. Tiny babies under three, again, they will stop. They will listen to the sound of an unfamiliar voice. So they're really learning at this very, very young age. It's amazing. Moving on, you know, four to six months. They, babies, you know, begin to, you know, again, respond to more. They start to recognize changes in tone of voice, 
in other sounds than speech. They may start to become fascinated by toys and other objects that make sounds and begin to enjoy music and rhythm and look in an apprehensive way for the source of sounds. Where are they coming from? Was that, what was that? You know, the toaster, the, the birds chirping, you know, various sounds within their environment. And as they approach 7 to 12 months, it's an exciting time. Babies, you know, are really listening to, you know, when they're spoken to, they start to recognize their own name, and they discover games like peekaboo. As, you know, there's always a range. As, as they approach 10 to 12 months, this is the period of time that, you, you know, you realize they're starting to recognize the names of familiar objects and people, daddy, car, nose, phone, ball, and they begin to respond to requests such as give me more juice, simple questions, and as we move along one to two years of age, they begin to attend to pictures in books and start to point to pictures in books when you name them. And they identify a few body parts when asked, nose and eyes and tummy, and start to understand more commands. Push the bus, don't touch, it's hot, and understand simple questions. Where's the bunny? What's in, what's in your purse? Your toddler now likes to, you know, really listen to simple stories and enjoys when you sing songs or say rhymes. It's a stage when they will want to hear the same story and, do, and play the same game over and over again. And as they're approaching two to three years, they begin to understand two-step commands. Get your socks and bring them to me. And two-step, what we call unrelated. Get your shoes and your car and bring them to mommy. And understanding other, other concepts like hot, cold, stop, go, in, out, on, under, nice, yucky, and begins to um, notice sounds like the telephone or the doorbell ringing and associating that and getting excited and try to get you to, you know, answer. Um, so it's an exciting time. So language, receptive language really involves you know, a lot. It's complex. So let's see what you think. Is it true that most children who have a receptive language disorder have typically developing expressive language? So if you will take um, an opportunity to use your poll function and respond either the yes or no um, as the question uh, emerges <laughs> on the PowerPoint. Um, We'll give folks a few minutes to uh, indicate their responses here. All right. okay. Give folks a few more seconds here. We're getting a lot of responses. Appreciate that. All right. Um, it does look like, obviously, the vast majority of the respondents have indicated, yes, it is true that most children have, um, who have a receptive disorder have a typically developing expressive language. So, um, Shauna, I'll let you um, address that. So, um, is it true that most children have a receptive language disorder have typically developing expressive language? The answer is no. It's kind of a, a, an odd question. Children need to understand spoken language before they can use language effectively. So in most cases, the child with a receptive language difficulty also has an expressive delay or disorder, which means they have trouble using words or spoken language. So why? Is receptive language important? Receptive language is important to, in order to communicate successfully. 
just like today, we're, you know, we rely on a lot of visuals and we're all, you know, learning in different ways. Um, children who have difficulties understanding may find it difficult, you know, or challenging to follow instructions at home or within their daycare setting and other situations and may not respond appropriately to questions and requests and really rely on a lot of support. These difficulties in understanding may lead to attention and listening difficulties and maybe behavioral issues. In mo as most activities require a good understanding of language, it may also make it difficult for a child to participate in activities like I said, in many other situations in their natural environment. In, in future years, these difficulties can make it difficult and challenging in school and across different settings. So what is a receptive language delay or disorder? It's difficulties understanding language that results in differences in how or what a child understands when compared to other children his or her own age. And remember our norms. So in EI, we use our testing tools as well as parent caregiver report to determine eligibility for EI services. In this definition, it, you know, it refers to, the, to a comparison. So that is groups of children that, you know, that where our testing has been normed. So it's group studies have been conducted and, the, and hence the development of testing tools. For SLPs in particular, we use the Rossetti Infant Toddler Language Scale or the REAL um, and then in, in EI in specifically. And then DTs, our uh, developmental therapists, are using the Hawaii Early Learning Profile or the Battelle Developmental Inventory to gauge, you know, where is the child functioning in terms of receptive language. For most infants and children, language develops naturally at birth. So to develop language, a child must be able to hear, see, understand, and remember. Children must also have the ability to form speech, the physical ability. And as the statistic says here in this information that I'm sharing from the National Institute of Health, up to one out of every 20 children has symptoms of a language disorder. You know, I feel like this is very powerful as we go out and we see children and to really determine is it atypical or is it typical? Are there just a few things and they're just behind a little bit? or is intervention necessary. So when the cause is unknown, it is called a developmental language disorder. Problems with receptive language skills usually begin before the age of four. Some mixed language disorders are caused by things like brain injury. And sometimes they, they can be misdiagnosed as developmental disorders. Language disorders may, may occur in children with other developmental or medical you know, issues, um, autism, hearing loss, learning disabilities, but language disorders are rarely caused by the lack of intelligence. Language disorders are different than delayed language. With delayed language, the, t the child is developing speech and language in the same way as other children, but later. In language disorders, speech and language do not develop normally or in a typical manner. The child may have some language skills, but not others, and, or in the way in which these skills develop will be different than usual. We can move on to the next slide. So as a, just to recap here, so a language delay may be following a usual pattern in sequence. It's just slower than that of other children the same age. 
There are lots of different ways that speech, language, and communication needs are described, and the terminology can be very confusing. When a child is learning to talk, they follow particular patterns and gain certain skills at certain ages. However, not all children gain the skills we expect, and they struggle to learn to understand and talk. So a language delay means that their language is like that of a younger child. You can keep moving on this slide. Thank you. So a language disorder, communication skills will likely be different, or they're peculiar. Something is peculiar and noticeable and have real difficulty forming their words and sentences to talk to others. So it's, again, not following the usual pattern or sequence. It's developing in an unusual or atypical pattern or differently from other children the same age. So keep those things in mind when you compare. So let's discuss evaluation because language, you know, that is disordered secondary to a medical diagno diagnosis is easier to quantify and it's expected. But when we refer to a language delay, it isn't always easy to, to determine the cause. It is critical that we analyze the situation carefully and take into account all the information within your evaluation to determine if the delay is significant to warrant intervention or not. So the term evaluation in early intervention is used when eligibility is determined. Assessment is also happening at all times and throughout early and throughout your intervention. The term assessment is also used in EI at the annual interval for redetermining eligibility. Again, we rely on our testing tool, observation, and caregiver and parent report to determine any language delay or disorder. And a comprehensive evaluation should include birth and medical and social history, so you should be very aware. Is there a diagnosis? What are the known complications associated with that diagnosis? What are the hearing test results at birth? Any ear infections, sinus, upper respiratory, allergy, environmental exposures? There's all sorts of things we have to take into account. Has, has the child been in foster care, adopted from another country? This is part of the social history. Is there, are there any mental health or learning disabilities? Other things to consider, what's the primary language and what languages are spoken in the home and when? A child may be having a difficult time learning both languages if there is a true delay in the primary language. It's always best to know ahead of time to find a bilingual SLP to conduct an evaluation in the primary language and if not, the use of an interpreter. There may not be a language delay or disorder, but a difference if the child is tested in a language unfamiliar to him and her, and the results may not be reliable. Just something that you definitely need to consider. The caregivers and the parents, this is huge. You know, how many times do we go and we we can't elicit things from the child. The child doesn't want to interact. So we really rely heavily on the parent and the caregiver to, to provide us information. And who is caring for the child is important to know. Are they, you know, at home? Are they in a daycare situation? Um, is it grandparents that may be taking care of the child? Um, foster parents? Is it a temporary situation? All of these things can impact their development. Environment and exposure, another big factor to consider. What is the physical environment? You know, I, how many times have you been in a home and it's there's just no light coming into the, you know, the house, it's smoke filled, it's loud, or is it very, very quiet, abnormally quiet? 
um, you know, understanding what the typical day is like, the stimulation, the interaction, and does it seem like the child is getting that stimulation within the home? Do they have other opportunities for community activities? Gathering all of this information to make your best um, guess about whether, you know, intervention is necessary. So again, trying to get a glimpse of what daily life is like for the child. Having a parent describe, asking the parent open-ended questions, and ask if they agree or disagree with what you're saying to them. Ask if what you're observing is typical or not. In early intervention, we utilize our testing tools and informed clinical opinion to determine eligibility. And remember, eligibility is having a 30% delay or greater in one or more areas. The 30% or greater would only qualify the child for early intervention. The services, the frequency, and the type of services are determined at the IFSP as a team, considering the family's priorities. Where the SLP, the speech language pathologist, again, is considered the expert in this area, as an early interventionist, one should be able to, to be competent to carry out strategies that facilitate receptive language, no matter the discipline. And let's not forget, the parent is the expert on his or her own child, and we as interventionists guide and coach families in making the most difference and the biggest difference. So after you've you know, gathered all this information, one of the biggest questions to ask yourself, is the behavior or the observation typical or atypical of, of not only this particular child in this moment, but of all of other children, his or her age, same medical diagnosis, similar background information, taking everything into account. What is the norm? And having familiarity of what is expected or typical for the individual child using test results and your informed clinical opinion, along with competency to administer the tools, are keys to making a good decision. So remember, our tools don't diagnose. We have to utilize everything, pulling together the information gathered and ask ourselves, you know, and consider, what did the family say? Did you ask, you know, describe your day with your child? Those, type, those types of questions, you really gain a lot of information. But sometimes our testing tools, in, in given the diagnosis, um, they're not normed for the population, such as hearing loss. So we have to make, make um, adaptations, and we have to um, make note of any differences that could skew the results and the reliability of your report. So just be sure to do that. If you are, if you should be familiar with your testing tool, and you can look in the examiner's manual to see a good, you know, representative sample that was um, taken for that particular test. Okay, we can move on. So, again, <coughs> excuse me, you need to have a solid understanding of what is typical. So I just wanted to give you other, you know, examples of milestones to consider, and whether you're a new therapist or a very experienced therapist, I think it's always important to refer, you know, back to and look at various um, resources. This particular one comes from ASHA, and how does your child hear and talk? So the link is um, at the bottom of the slide, but it's pretty easy to find. And so you can take a look at these, and again, all of the lists or the resources, the milestones, you know, they're not all encompassing, but there should be some similarities and definitely um, 
you know, utilizing those and knowing what's expected. And you should know it without even using a testing tool. But that does come with time and experience. <clears throat> so take a look at these. And again, you should recognize similarities. I don't have to go over all of those. You can look it up um, on ASHA's website. But again, we went over some of these in the previously mentioned milestones. All right, Sean, I'm going to okay. leave those up here um, since it's taking a little bit of time to load. But um, this is a point where we will be um, opening up for questions. So it does look like we have a couple. Um, there was a question from um, Kyla wanting to know if your statistic of 1 out of 20, if this has increased, decreased, or um, been fairly stable over the course of years. So um, what, are your, what are your thoughts on that? Shauna? I'm sorry. I'm talking away and don't have the chalk button pushed. <laughs> so I was just saying, I had seen an article on Ash's website, actually, um, about the number of you know, children with language delays or disorders you know, increasing. I guess it would depend on um, you know, how, you know, what's involved in that particular um, study and stat. Um, I think this was in, in general 1 in 20, um, but I definitely see an increase, you know, in the number of children being identified. So I think it's really critical, you know, to ask yourself the questions that we've been, that I've been going over. You know, is this a delay? Is it a disorder? Is it um, a situation where the child is just behind? but is developing in a, you know, in a typical way that maybe intervention isn't the best solution right now. So think about that a little bit more. Uh, Janet has a question uh, about when do you decide if something is atypical? So if you suspect apraxia, is that atypical? Um, if a child has many ear infections or is un un unintelligible, is that atypical? So when do you decide if something is atypical? I think, I think it's pretty obvious, you know, and I think it depends on what you're talking about, if it's receptive language, which we're focusing on, or expressive. But, you know, certainly the things that you just mentioned are atypical. You know, it is, you have to, you have to understand typical and development and what is the norm to determine what is atypical. So, We'll talk about it a little more, but, excuse me, <coughs> but, you know, when I see a child that, for, for receptive language purposes, if they're not able to follow my directions, if I'm getting that blank look, if they're responding in a way that wasn't appropriate to the context, then those are definitely red flags and I would consider atypical. Does that help answer the question? We'll find out if they respond. Um, there's also a question from Dawn, and, um, and I'm, I'm going to generalize this more, but when you have children who have specific diagnosis, such as Down syndrome, do you consider their delays to be atypical because of the hypotonia or dysarthria um, affecting development, or do you consider that to be a typical language delay? You know, that's a good question. I think there's always been you know, some some question about, well, what's atypical? What's typical? And especially when we're having to report that. I tend to look at the medical diagnoses as a whole. You know, what is what kinds of delays are expected, you know, for a child that has Down syndrome, you know, and, and do they occur across that population? Um, you can certainly have you know, a child with, with Downs that may be having other difficulties, you know, that other children don't have. So I think the question can, the answer can be that you can have both. You can have typical when compared to that medical diagnosis and atypical when it's kind of outside the norm. 
of that diagnosis, if that makes sense. That's my that's my understanding. All right. Um, got a couple more questions. We'll see if we can get them both addressed here. Um, uh, Rabia wants to know what is the best way to bring up the subject to families that a certain language area needs more work than others, especially if the parents really aren't aware of um, of any issues. Well, I think you know first and foremost is you know having established a good relationship with that family and understanding um you know just the whole the dynamics and you know how can you how can you bring up you know something that um may not be a comfortable situation um I think giving examples and just really talking openly and seeing if they're concerned. You know, I I noticed, you know, that he's not, that, you know, he or she is not really answering the questions. He's repeating versus giving you, giving me a yes or no or a specific response. Have you noticed that, Mom, Mom Dad? And then you kind of open up that dialogue to finding out more. And then it becomes more comfortable. Okay, um, we are probably going to move on. I see that there are some other questions that I will um, allow. We'll, we'll get to on the next one, but just to kind of put a bug in your ear, Shauna. There are some questions about uh, selective mutism versus social anxiety. So that might be. I, I don't know if that's something you're um, addressing a little bit later or incorporating that in, but just kind of stick that in the back of your mind that that's going to be a question that comes up for you to address uh, next time. So uh, we'll go ahead and move on. Okay. I hadn't really put any of that into the presentation, but, you know, we can talk about it a little later if, if that comes back up. Okay. So, the question, a question is, what causes a receptive language delay or disorder? So, we discussed some of the disorders and the associated difficulties and some of the rather obvious delays and, and difficulties when there's a medical diagnosis, you know, and having those symptoms for a receptive language disorder, but what other time, what about other times when it's not so clear? So the cause of receptive language disorder is often unknown, but is thought to consist of a number of factors, really a combination of things such as the child's genetic susceptibility. Is there, is there a family history? <clears throat> the child's exposure to language and their general developmental and cognitive abilities. These are definitely things you want to consider. A receptive language disorder is often associated with other developmental disorders, as we discussed, autism, Down syndrome being only a couple of those. And in other cases, receptive language disorder may be caused by brain injury or trauma, disease. And for some children, again, it is difficulty, um, the difficulties with language is the only developmental problem that they experience. So some causes of speech and language disorders include hearing loss, neurological disorders, brain injury, drug abuse, physical impairments, and intellectual disabilities, um, and just other physical impairments that have to do with more about expressive, but just as an example of overall speech and language disorders. And this is just to name a few. So let's, let's think about what is atypical. Often we hear the mom or the dad or the caregiver, you know, he or she just wants to, to play in his own world. He wants to play alone. And we hear, you know, these things that, to me, we ask ourselves, typical or atypical, that's atypical. Children should want to play with others. And I, I recently evaluated a child who really, really relied on visuals to respond. For example, I was, I said, stand up, stand up, and waited, that five second rule, 
stand up. And I repeated it several times with only that verbal cue. And then I had to give a gestural cue, lifting my arms up so that she could follow through with what I was wanting her to do. And I noted during my interactions, it, because observation is so critical, you know, just really taking in, what are you seeing? You know, taking, a, taking the time to just really look at a child in free play and um, not always being, you know, concerned with your testing tool and checking things off. So I noticed she was really, really distracted and easily so by anything that moved, made noise, or came within her sight. Um, and that's just one example, you know, of, of atypical, you know, and kind of red flags for me. Another child, you know, required a tactile cue when I said, when I said verbally, hands out, when I was, I was trying to get him to throw a ball back to me, hands out, and I, I think I probably even modified my words, my language. So, it, and then he required, again, a gestural cue, a different um, word for him to be able to understand. So I often find myself either shortening the message or choosing other words to ensure comprehension. So these are just examples of, of red flags and what I would consider atypical. And on the slide, you can see some other things. Not responding to name, ignoring that spoken language, um, difficult to gain attention, uh, difficulty following verbal directions, repeating questions versus answering, answering questions incorrectly, using echolalia rather than that purposeful uh, response or language, and difficulty processing information. So just some to name a few. <clears throat> So what is a echolalia? I mentioned that. It's repeating or echoing, hence the name, what another person has said. Children who are echolalic imitate what they hear from people in their lives, something in a book, in a movie, and many parents, you know, will tell us, wow, you know, he just is advanced in his language. He can tell me a whole story, or he can sing this whole song and, you know, never skip a beat, but cannot ask me for milk. So in my mind, you know, that's atypical. They can't use the words for interaction and purposeful, and purposeful communication. So it can be atypical or typical. So let's, let's see what you think. Here's a question for so, you. So we have another question, and the question is, which of these statements is not true about echolalia? So um, go to your poll function, and the questions are coming up on the screen. The first one is a normal part of language development. The second is that echolalia is considered atypical in children 18 to 30 months, or um, that it's considered typical in children 18 to 30 months. So which one of these statements is not true? So using your poll functions, looks like folks are finding it. Um, right. All right, we'll give folks uh, some time there to respond. Okay. All right. Um, it does look like we've got some um, responses here. Um, and they are coming in. So far, it looks like C is the one that fo most folks are choosing to be not true. Um, the responses are still coming in, but um, of the ones that are responded, it looks like um, maybe 40% of folks have chosen uh, that the third one answer. Uh, perhaps another 30% or so have selected um, answer B. So the majority of folks are saying that um, the third answer is not true. So let's see what we have. Shauna? Okay. So. 
here, this is a true test of <laughs> the understanding of the question. <laughs> no, I'm kidding. It's, but it is a little tricky because in the way that it's asked, you know, is it not true? And I think um, you may be surprised. But for the most part, statement B reflects the best answer. It is considered atypical in children 18 to 30 months. So that's saying that's not true. So let's, let's talk about that a little bit more. Um, it can be atypical echolalia in that language is not always used purposefully. Researchers have found that up to 85% of people with autism exhibit echolalia in some form, but then they can use it to learn how to communicate. Here's the piece you may, you know, and it'll, it'll hit home and you'll realize it can be typical. Echolalia is part of normal language development. It starts around 18 months when a child is learning to imitate phrases. So if we think about that typical path of development, you know, 18, 19 months, of course, there's a range. You know, children are starting to imitate more of what they hear others saying. They're starting to learn to put words together at that age. And they will sound like a little parrot, you know, mimicking what they're hearing. But it's really the way that they are doing so. Um, you know, experts tell us that it peaks around 30 months and declines significantly by the time a child is three. So if you think about it again, over between that 18 month to 30 month period, children are learning to put more and more, more and more words together. Their utterances become longer. You know, they're imitating, and we're working on all of that with children as interventionists. You know, putting putting two words together, then three words, then four, and so forth, and learning then to communicate in sentences. But the the imitative part or the echolalic portion starts to decline and their caring, children should be carrying out more meaningful conversations rather than just imitating it. So I um, hope that helps clarify that. So in children with autism in particular and it being atypical and kind of in comparison with what we just talked about, um, echolalia occurs with greater frequency and it lasts for a longer period of time than it does with those children developing um, typical in a typical way. So, you know, um, those children that are developing t typically may sing songs and quote phrases, but they don't do it repetitively or completely out of context. So, Again, we expect a hierarchy of typical sequence of language development with imitation or that echolalia fading. Okay? So I just wanted to bring that up because I feel like that happens. You know, we see that a lot and we wonder, is that typical or is that atypical? Okay, let's move on. So another um, a couple of other things I wanted to bring up. I'm not really going to get in, into too much depth about this, but language processing versus auditory processing. I felt like at least they, these terms should be brought up because they're often used too loosely and incorrectly. Um, and to individuals having trouble, you know, with listening and processing spoken language. There could be many reasons for difficulties in language and in listening. So just, again, just kind of an overview. Central auditory processing refers to how the central nervous system takes in the auditory information. It is an auditory deficit, and it shouldn't be confused with other cognitive or language or related disorders. A child with auditory processing disorder is able to hear sounds, but their brain interprets the sounds atypically. So although 
um, you know, gathering this information is helpful in, in diagnosing um, CAPD or central auditory processing disorder. It's actually diagnosed by an audiologist. And in, with the kids that we're working with now early on, we're not, they're not going to, to be diagnosed this early. So it's just you may see some of the things that, you know, could end up being CAP, but it's just way too early. Um, I don't see children being diagnosed with that, um, you know, until at least the age of five and sometimes older. But um, language processing refers to the ability to attach meaning to what is heard and to formulate and to be able to formulate an expressive response. It's extremely, it's an extremely important skill that affects many areas of a child's life. So it's critical that we be, um, that we correctly identify it and, effect, and effectively address it. So we might also observe, you know, these kids, as I mentioned earlier, kind of some of those atypical things, um, having very delayed responses or no response at all, staring, you know, you, how many times have you thought, oh gosh, I can just see their wheels spinning, but they're, you can just tell they're not understanding what I'm saying. Um, and they may just respond in a completely different way. So there could be some difficulties with language processing. Why we need to understand the difference? For a yes. second because um, there there are a couple questions just to clarify, um, and and maybe need to do this now. Mm -hmm. okay. um, there is a question about who can di can a um, SLP diagnose um, language processing disorder, or do you need to refer that to someone else? Language processing, you can definitely, you know, do a lot of different batteries for that. Again, that is something that I wouldn't be doing in probably till, you know, school age, not really necessarily zero to three. I just think that we may be seeing some of those signs and red flags and we should be trying to implement strategies to help them at this age. Okay. Yeah, and, and again, go ahead. No, um, also, Allison's kind of curious about how um, kind of a um, OT is called the area um, sensory processing and auditory area as auditory processing, and so there's just kind of some curiosity about just how it's termed and and you know distinguishing between the two seem to address that pretty well. There is just one other question though that goes back to the echolalia and. Um, Melinda had a question about um, when you have ch children who are given a choice between two and they always say the last choice. Does this kind of fall under echolalia? Hmm. Well, I, tend, I think that it's just the, what they hear. They tend to say the last thing. It might indicate a problem with more processing, you know, and so therefore I kind of test that out a little bit. I switch it around and see, is that response meaningful? You know, are they just repeating? So, it, you know, I think it's a matter of looking at it a little closer and deciding, is it, is it echolalia or is it processing? Let me, you know, like I said, let me test this out a little bit. Let me, you know, switch the choices around and see, are they able to answer the question and, and give a meaningful answer? All right, I'm sorry for interrupting. I just wanted to catch those here real quick. Oh, that's okay. So let's see. Um, let me see where I am. Um, so then why do we need to understand the difference? Well, it just, in order to effectively address a child's difficulty with listening, it's important to understand where the breakdown is occurring. So some children with attentional deficits may have trouble comprehending or remembering verbal information, even though the, like the processing and their, their auditory um, component is intact. Their ability to, to process the information is maybe more impacted by the difficulty with attention as opposed to an auditory deficit. So it's just important, again, just to really get a full understanding and kind of um, test things out in, you know, in different situations and get the facts. Where is the breakdown occurring? 
and they can look similar, um, definitely. So again, in EI, we may just be seeing those early signs as children aren't diagnosed early on at this age range, but again, it's important to recognize the red flags and incorporate strategies and help parents address these concerns in their everyday lives. So how can parents, you know, support and how can you support um, difficulties that you may be seeing with receptive language? Using visuals, presenting information in multiple ways. We all learn in different ways, whether we're auditory learners, you know, you need hands-on, um, you need visuals to learn. Um, so presenting information in, in various ways, allowing more thinking time, kind of having that five-second rule, and sometimes it takes longer for a child to respond. And patience is, is important. Um, encouraging your child to ask for help um, and and to have them ask, you know, for to the, for you to repeat instead of just saying I don't know, I don't know. That tends to be, you know, a response that we'll get. Um, make sure the child is ready to listen before speaking. So think about those environmental. Distractions, gaining the child's full attention, good eye contact, um, and in a very basic level at this age, you know, and as, as they get closer to three, um, but don't take it for granted that a child knows, you know, idioms or figurative language. So if a parent says, cut that out, they may not know what that means. Um, so we use a lot of, of figurative language and we need to make sure they understand that. Increasing the child's awareness, you know, of just, of their strengths. You know, they, children thrive on, on praise, and so we should be giving them lots of positive encouragement. So when you see difficulties with receptive language and understanding, you may, you may also see other, other difficulties. We've mentioned some of these you know, throughout, but here are just some of the things that may go along with it. Expressive language difficulties, for sure. If they're not understanding, you may see some outbursts, some negative behaviors. Um, again, difficulties with attention and concentration, social skills, literacy as a child, you know, getting older and learning how to read and write. Um, that executive functioning, meaning like the reasoning, reasoning and thinking skills, problem solving. These are just some examples. So expressive language definitely ties in, you know, to um, communication. And we've been talking a lot about receptive language, but um, you know, just to be aware of some signs of expressive language, because you will see that often paired with um, receptive language difficulties. So not using many words, limited vocabulary, um, grasping for the right word to say, or word finding problems, um, using the wrong words within context. So a child with a language disorder may have one or more of these symptoms, and they can really range from mild to severe. So children, um, you know, if well, may have an expressive language disorder if they're having difficulties expressing themselves and what they're thinking or, you know, needing to say to get their needs met. So here's some more that we're putting up here on the slide. And as a child's, you know, getting closer to three, you may or may not see these difficulties surfacing, just kind of depending on their, their spoken language. So there's a connection between receptive and expressive language. And as we've learned, it's clearly evident the importance of understanding language before you can use it. It's like driving a car. 
If you don't know the reason for the parts, let alone the names of them, the steps in the process, it's difficult to start the car, put it into gear, take off, steer, and head in the right direction, simultaneously paying attention to everything around you and knowing how to respond. Think about that. <laughs> this is another um, short break for questions. I'm kind of looking through and I'm seeing a lot of um, dialogue back and forth, a lot of um, strategies being shared. Um, I'm going to move us on because we do have um, 10 minutes left. And um, I'm going to keep pouring through theirs and see if there's any more um, specific questions um, that we can address at the very end. But Shauna, we got, I'm just going to kind of move this along. So. Sure, no problem. Okay, so it's our role as early interventionists to provide the family and the child with building blocks necessary to develop receptive language. And some of the building blocks would be attention and concentration, pre-language skills, social skills, and play skills. So we're going to talk about those a little bit, one at a time. And that's, a, you know, I think that's a good motto, one step at a time. We have to really remind our families um, that we're in the children we're working with, you know, it's baby steps. First, we might need to have, for instance, in this case, attention and concentration. You know, if we don't have that sustained effort, you know, being able to do activities without distraction and holding on to it to complete the task, we're probably not going to be able to get, you know, the speech and language that we're trying to address. So attention is critical. I know I work a lot on getting eye contact, getting children to complete tasks, and, and really maintaining um, and obviously depending on the age, you know, we have expectations. We also have those pre-language skills. You know, it's important to identify nonverbal means of communicating and recognizing and, and understanding that these are prerequisites to spoken language. We have to remind families who, you know, the parents are anxious for their child to talk, but you have to point out, you know, not, communication is mostly nonverbal. Look at the gestures. Look at the facial expressions. Look at the, look at the eye contact and the joint attention we have. So really remembering those things. And all of this, you know, it leads up to social skills. And, you know, being able to engage with others and interaction is huge. If you don't have interaction, I feel like you can't have language. You can't have communication. So I explained to families that the interaction and the reciprocity needs to happen before words. We need that turn taking, that eye contact, that use of body language, and again, the attention and concentration. And then we have play skills. Children learn through play. So as interventionists and parents, you know, we really need to follow the child's lead. We have to be creative. You know, as children are very independent and they have their preferences. And, you know, we're placing demands on them, but you can do it in a way that they feel that they have the control and that you're building language within the context, within the context, whatever it may be. And they will comply, you know, with direction and, and that give and take. And I believe you can incorporate language into any activity. So make it fun. So as we're thinking about, um, you know, play and following that child's lead, just wanted to give you some strategies for success and what can be done to improve receptive language. A big thing is reducing that background noise. You know, many times I have to ask, can we turn the TV off, <laughs> you know? So I, can, I need to really hear. I need to get, you know, the child's full attention, um, whether it be radio or any other distraction. Um, you want to definitely get face-to-face -face with the child when talking. Try to get good eye contact before giving them a verbal instruction. You want to give minimal instructions one at a time. Refrain from too many at once. You want to simplify the language used so it's at a level that they can understand. So usually, you know, think about their expressive language or how much they're saying, and then that kind of is a good gauge for what you might need to say to them. 
chunking verbal instructions into parts. Instead of saying, you know, go get your shoes and your coat and go outside, you'd want to break that down. Get your shoes, and when the child responds, now get your coat, and now go outside. And eventually, they'll be able to handle, you know, more than one direction at a time. But chunk it and see if they're successful. Um, repeating, ask the child to repeat. So I often say, you know, have the child recall, you know, what you've asked them to do. Repeat the instruction. Go get your cup and sit at the table. What did mommy ask you to do? And then have them recall. And then first then statements are very helpful for attention and just understanding and using some of those terms in, for sequencing. So keeping it simple, showing and emphasizing, emphasizing what you want them to do. Use the words the child uses. And I cannot stress enough, repetition, repetition, repetition. Talk about everything in the environment. And this is probably one of the biggest strategies that I tell parents. You want to, you're going to feel like you're talking to yourself, and sometimes you are, but you want to say, you know, mommy's cooking dinner. We're going to have hamburgers, you know, what are we going to have? And so you're incorporating all of those things naturally. Following that child's lead and model how to play, providing visuals and hands-on experiences, a big one providing choices, and at eye level is key. Um, choosing different words when the child doesn't understand the words that you've used. Um, confirm that the child understands. Pause frequently giving the child time to think, and be consistent with realistic expectations. Some activities that can help improve receptive language, um, naming things together while completing a task, labeling and describing again, the world around the child in their own environment as well as visiting new places, looking in, re looking in books and reading books together and recall, explaining new concepts in various ways, playing I spy in different games, cooking and crafts for, for um, new vocabulary you want to introduce, simple sequencing, first this, then that, next, last, those sorts of concepts. So by providing these as well as other motivating and natural opportunities for engagement, play, understanding, and use of language, a child will be a step ahead in learning and understanding the world around him. Great. So that concludes the webinar. I hope you've enjoyed it. I hope you have some takeaways from today. And with lots of great information. Um, if, if you're looking at the chat, you're seeing that we've kind of moved to a hot topic and that um, is the use of um, tablets and um, those types of things, the use of technology um, and verbal development, comprehension and, and, and verbal development. So what were your thoughts on the use of technology and screen time? Oh, for sure. You know, I can't list every strategy um, just like we do on the outcome pages. You know, we can only list a handful of things. But um, for sure, kids are motivated by that. Every child in this world knows what a phone is. There's so many apps. You know, I think with everything, it's um, moderation, you know, because you want the child to engage and interact with people first and foremost. But it can be used as a motivator and, you know, and if you're trying to work on a, something else and you're, you know, with mom and dad, um, you know, certainly almost every household has something in their home. So, yes. All right. Um, also, let's see, there were, um, there was some other information, some questions about, um, uh, well, actually, I'm kind of looking through, and I'm just seeing more comments again. Um, I'm not seeing any more actual questions related to the webinar. So um, 
I think we're ready to kind of wrap it up. And I appreciate so much your information, Shauna, and thank you.